All right. Today we're going to explore Alfred North Whitehead or his fail on Bergson. So we look at the allure of epics, a key uh, concept in his work. See how it runs aground in the Rock of Gibson, how it's just back to the abstract space disguised, and his solution to the twin paradox. Well, not so much. Again, a failure of time or on time. That is what we're going to see is quite a interesting rejection of Bergson. So we've noted the big three in the pantheon of modern philosophy, as judged by academic philosophy, Whitehead, Heidegger, Wittgenstein, and of course, also high in the pantheon, Herr Kant. Bergson is at best down with the masses in philosophy's opinion. We've looked at Bergson's own dissection, dissection of Kant in 47, and we've seen Heidegger, in essence, also rather a fail on Bergson. So there's Whitehead, seemingly so close to Bergson, process philosophy, a near contemporary, influenced by Bergson, but how, and how close really? We did a Sartre fail on Bergson, number 12. This was the failure of an explicit critique of Bergson's theory, a complete misunderstanding. There is a different, or this is a different, more Heideggerian-like sort of fail in terms of, of Whitehead. Bergson sits vaguely in the background of Whitehead, vaguely. In Process and Reality, he mentions Bergson only in, with, with respect to the subject of intuition. In a book on time, on consciousness, that's it, a slight reference to intuition. Pete Gunter, he was a great Bergson apologist. That's his book there, Bergson and the Evolution of Physics. He noted H. Wilden Carr. Carr was an early expositor of Bergson. His was the first book I read because you never read the real Bergson, just an expositor. This book, 1911, The Philosophy of Change, Henry Bergson. For Gunter, there's all kinds of evidence on Carr passing information about Bergson to Whitehead. They were together for a year at the Aristotelian Society. Just saying, we don't know, as far as I know, how much Bergson that Whitehead actually read, actually studied, which may explain epics. In Whitehead, we're going to see the flow of time broken into epics or occasions, chunks. The why of this is curious for the background for the background of Whitehead, we should place just a little bit of Bergson. Remember Bergson's treatment of Zeno in uh, the uh, Achilles in the tortoise paradox. Achilles never quite catches the tortoise because he's successively having the distance, infinitely having the distance, half by half by half. So he never catches the tortoise. Likewise, in the arrow paradox, the arrow is always coincident with the point, a static point over the surface that it moves. So it never moves. For Bergson, this is because underlying the motion by Achilles of the arrow, we see a space, a line. The line or the space is infinitely divisible, ultimately an infinity of points or positions. Each point on the space and the line corresponds to an instant of time. So time just becomes another dimension of the space. We end up with a four dimensional space. An infinite regress, this is, because to account for motion between each pair of the static points, and they're static, we must introduce the motion to have motion at all. Otherwise we're explaining motion by immobility, which is absurd. So every point an instant. This spatial treatment is the core problem of the paradoxes for Bergson. For him, motion must be treated as indivisible, like a melody or each note. If we're, if we're talking instance, permeates or interpenetrates the next, forming an organic continuity, an indivisible, not divisible into instance. This indivisible motion characterizes the 
transformation of the universal field, what we can call time. What in retrospect, Bergson saw as a holographic field, as we've noted many times. This cosmic or physics implication was clearly discussed in matter and memory. And with 2.3 seconds of thought was also inherent already in time and free will in his discussion of time. We saw that Heidegger missed this. To him, Bergson's time only applied to consciousness. Well, a warning, we'll hit a similarly based stumble in Whitehead. But the indivisibility of time or motion and the rejection of any reality to Zeno had to be the minimum transmitted to Whitehead. Yet, was not. Bergson had built his theory on his insight into our immediate experience and its flow. Note the subtitle, Time and Free Will, his first book, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness. Whitehead also meant to build his metaphysics on an insight into immediate human experience. But the flow of experience, well, he broke it up. So much for indivisibility. He called his ultimate ontological units actual occasions, or epochs for short. Intuitively, we go to do something like this. Epic one, I break the eggs. Epic two, I pick up my wooden spoon. I insert it into the batter for epic three. Epic four, I stir for 10 seconds. Epic five, I lift the spoon out. Epic six, I put it on the table. Immediately we say, well, this seems reasonable, except but what is the principled method by which epochs are defined or demarcated? By what principles? This becomes a question. We'll come back to this. So why did Whitehead do this? How did he, did he arrive at epics? For Bergson, the transformation of the holographic field is indivisible. Equivalently, the becoming of the field, same thing, is indivisible. For Whitehead, if we admit that something becomes, it is easy by employing Zeno's method to prove that there can be no continuity of becoming. Implication. Bergson's analysis of Zeno and this spatialization of, at its core, that is well, treating all motion in terms of the space and the line, is meaningless. Zeno is right. So, we flip Bergson into the wastebasket. James Felt, the uh, philosopher, commentator on this, said he thought Alfred Nord Whitehead, the MW, made too much of J William James' assertion that reality grows literally by buds or drops of perception. You can see the, the epic like thing there. For uh, Whitehead, the only way to make rational sense of becoming is instances of becoming succeed one another in time, like our epics. They are temporally thick, so they have some duration, some time. They are not temporally divisible within themselves. This non-divisibility of epics is kind of the one concession I can see to Bergson. Kind of, as we'll see. But again, why? Why the only way to make rational sense of becoming? For Felt, Cobb's free agency framework explains this, Cobb being a Whiteheadian philosopher. For him, human acts must be caused and to free caused from within. So this comprises self-determination, caused human acts and caused from within. If we hold that cause must precede effect, if, then self-determination becomes a series of states, each state caused by the preceding state. But in this, then, there is no locus for a free state. That is, each state is caused by the preceding state. So in self-determination, the cause, the agent, must be simultaneous with the effect, the action to avoid this causal chain. This moment of decision, can it be instantaneous? No, action cannot occur in a timeless instant, a mathematical point of an instant. 
spread over a period of time? Well, no, on that either. If the deciding act, the act of decision, is a continuous becoming, it is subject to Zeno's argument. Notice they're always going back to Zeno. The act is shivered into a series of series of instantaneous states. And in this, there can be no process. How to escape this problem? How to escape the problem? Root one, Kant's. Freedom makes no sense within the causal fabric of human experience. It yet makes intelligible sense within a realm transcending that experience of Kant's transcendence. Root two, Whitehead's. Becoming is discontinuous. Acts of becoming succeed one another in such a way as to take time, but they are not themselves temporally divisible, but are in some sense all at once, thus forming atomic yet temporally thick units of becoming. Now, the atomic discrete units need to be glued together. This is going to be interesting. So for Whitehead, the conclusion is that in every act of becoming, there is the becoming of something with temporal extension, but that the act itself is not extensive in the sense that it is divisible into earlier and later acts of becoming, which correspond to the extensive divisibility of what has become. So is the denying the divisibility of the epics. Elsewhere, he says, temporalization is not another continuous process. It is an atomic succession. Thus, time is atomic or epical, though what is temporalized is divisible. We could make this discussion and analysis elaborate. There's lots of things, but in my opinion, the essence of the problem is just too simple. We've already noted it. He simply accepts the validity of Zeno on the reality, the correctness, that is the correctness of the paradoxes. He ignores Bergson's analysis. And all of process and reality depends on this. To quote, James also refers to Zeno. In substance, I agree with his argument from Zeno, though I do not think that he allows sufficiently for those elements in Zeno's paradoxes, which are the product of inadequate mathematical knowledge, but I agree that a valid argument remains after the removal of the invalid parts. Thus, with respect to Achilles and the tortoise, quote, Zeno produces an invalid argument depending on ignorance of the theory of infinite convergent numerical series. Continuing, consider the first half second that Achilles runs as one of becoming. The next quarter second is another such act. The next eighth second is another, and so on indefinitely. Zeno then illegitimately assumes this infinite series of acts of becoming can never be exhausted, because Zeno believes infinity is infinity, apparently. But simple arithmetic, simple arithmetic, says Whitehead, assures us that the series will be exhausted in the period of one second. And of course, he's referring to this notion of a convergent series and taking the limit to end up with one, one second, where they're on the right. The way is then open for the intervention of a new act of becoming, that is, I guess, that is open for yet another epic, perhaps after the turtle is caught, which lies beyond the whole series, that is, after all those steps of Achilles. Thus, this paradox is based on a mathematical fallacy. So the Achilles paradox is solved, quote unquote, via convergent series. The arrow, arrow paradox he solves for another reason we won't go into. In this, Alfred North Whitehead is very much like his friend Russell, as we noted. A, here's a problem. The fourth paradox, where Zeno says a duration is a double of itself, is untouched. Remember the fourth paradox. We have three objects, A, B, and C. A is stationary, B is moving one way, C is moving another. At the start of the instant. And then for Zeno, during the same time or duration that B passes a certain length of the resting body A, so 
D, it passes the double the same length of the body C, moving toward it. Thus, a duration is the double of itself. For Bergson, underlying all four paradoxes was just one problem. The indivisible motion of both B and C is confused with the abstract, infinitely divisible space, the conceptual framework in which we mentally frame the motion. So Whitehead never addresses this critique, that is, this analysis of Zeno's problem by Bergson. He never explicitly addresses Bergson's analysis. So if H. Wilden Carr transmitted Bergson to Whitehead, this critical aspect of Bergson's theory certainly did not take. Went in the wastepath. Bergson thought so little of the convergence argument, he devoted about 100 words to it in the footnote in Creative Evolution. Why? Firstly, it's simply a mathematical artifice. If infinity is infinity, as Zeno presumed quite correctly, you don't stop it. You don't stop the infinite series of acts by simply taking a limit. Secondly, it's a, it's, it is relying on the abstract space, the very conceptual framework that is the core of the problem, Alliance, a, a reliance to which mathematics, the very nature of mathematics, is intrinsically wedded. Mathematics is dealing with links as per the intrinsically required translation to the abstract space, not actual motion. So Whitehead says seconds, we saw, talking about the first half of second, as we saw the Achilles, he says converges in one second, but the math is, in, is dealing in fact with lengths, spaces. This is a external conceptual framework to which Achilles has no actual physical relation. For Achilles, we talked about this, I think in uh, number three, substitute a robot. Now implement the halving computation of the series. When would the robot stop his very physical halving steps? Never. I mean, yes, it's going to get micro, uh, cosmic, I mean, mi microscopic in steps, but it's, he would never stop. According to his algorithm, he cannot stop. To stop, he'd have to say, oh, quick, do this computation, take the limit. What does this computation even mean? Now take one more step and, gr and grab the turtle, enough to, or enough to pass it, grab it, meet up with it, catch it. It means this. In reality, we shifted the robot to our external conceptual framework, taking a limit. Now proceed. It's entirely an artifice. One wonders why bother the robot to start having the steps at all. Just take the limit and jump to where you want to go. Same difference. Again, it's an artifice. So Whitehead ends in exactly the same conceptual framework that Zeno supposes, the same conceptual framework. The epochs are strung along the same conceptual line or space. The space or line is their basis for continuity. The epochs Atomic must be glued then for actual continuity. For this, White had introduced what he called prehension, grabbing. So that's his glue. Each epic grabs his preceding epic and the character of that epic. You break in the eggs, then I, break, I pick up the spoon, insert it into the batter. The, the character of each epic is grabbed and carried on to the next one. How? What, what the heck is this prehension? Gunter know that Charles Hart. Shorn, an eminent Whitehead scholar, could never answer this question. Ultimately, he's saying, well, it just happens. Whitehead never accepted Bergson's form of continuity, the indivisible flow, a melody, each note permeating interpenetrating the next, an organic continuity, no actual dis dis discreteness or discrete instance. This was a description of direct experience, not a conceptual framework. Yes, we are talking two forms of continuity that derived indeed from a direct experience from its flow and the abstract conceptual continuity, the space or the line. The self then becomes, without this mysterious apprehension, a string of floating epics. Felt registers an amazement that there are so many whitehead proponents that have talked themselves into this, though he knows Whitehead's own statement. 
Of course, it's always possible to work oneself into a state of complete contentment with an ultimate irrationality. So once he's many an employment of these ethics and theory papers, one came by the other day by Dr. Jason Brown on academia.edu, inviting uh, people such as me for review or comments. Now Brown is a uh, retired clinical professor of neurology. He's quite a student, uh, a scholar. He's written tons of books. He at the, was at the New York University Medical Center. And you see some of the books. Note the last one, Self and Process, very, very Whiteheadian. The paper opened with this, to quote, mental phenomena require duration, while duration without content would, would collapse to the relative immediacy of the animal mind. So you got to have something in those epics, something's going on, stirring or lifting. Otherwise, it would collapse to the immediacy of the animal mind. The duration can be sustained by ongoing perceptions and by or mental phenomena. So already one detects what will be Whitehead's legacy. Where is the continuity of consciousness going to come from? What's holding those epics together? For Bergson, the brain is integrally participating in the indivisible motion or transforming of the holographic field because it's part of that field. And as a reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field, the specifying portions or time extents of this indivisible past transformation of the field. There are no instants or epochs falling into non-existence, that is, into the past, the symbol of non-existence. But Whitehead rejected this indivisible motion. And he adds, every act, object, and utterance has a brief diachronic history, a succession of segments underlying endogenous imagery, leading to objects that are sculpted by sensibility to model the external world. So, okay, note the segments. And we are going to model the external world. And where is this model going to be? It goes on, early phases are memorial. The final stage is perceptual. Intermediate phases of short-term memory have memorial and perceptual features. All conscious experience is recollection adapted by sensation to a model of the real. Perception is vivid reminiscence, you know, it's Whitehead, with each occasion presupposes the antecedent world as active in its formation. So epoch two is grabbing this antecedent, epoch one, prehension. So it appears Dr. Brown is going to be successively storing the ongoing event in the brain while constructing a model somewhere of the external world. This is the realm of the hard problem, the origin of the image of the external world, which isn't really being explicitly address addressed here. But he goes on, the idea of a condensation of succession to simultaneity and the revival out of simultaneity to serial, or serial order the recollection of the past and the present from drive to object is a critical problem in any account of the origin of the present. Okay, so the ongoing stern, apparently is saying, is converted in the 3D brain to a vast series of stored slices or snapshots, like snapshots on a desktop, a static simultaneity. You have a static simultaneity stored, apparently, if the brain is doing anything, apparently, in the brain. Then the static simultaneity must be revived to again be put in motion. And again, where now is this? For now we're talking the actual perception. The gal scenes, the stirring, her spoon going back and forth, the, the swirling of the uh, cake batter, etc. Is this in some perceptual space in the brain somewhere? Where? How does this happen? Does the brain create it? To quote, in the sequence from onset to actuality, the completed mind-brain state becomes an epic. So this is an epic that perishes and is replaced by its successor with mental states stacked in the order of occurrence. So it takes all of the above, the succession to simultaneity, to motion conversion. Say it again. The succession to simultaneity to motion conversion to create an epic, 
which then perishes, goes away. So in my comment to Dr. Brown, I noted that things are worse. Presumably for him, things are going on in the brain. These things going on for cognitive science, well, each snapshot is parsed into features by no particular principled method. The various features are stored at different cortical spots. These features are then reassembled into the snapshot. Then they're all, it's all put together as an event, an ongoing flowing dynamic event, not just static pictures. How would Dr. Brown relate to the cog -Sci guys? Well, he res responded simply saying, well, I'm not really a storage or disassemble guy. So, okay, then things are pretty vague. What, what is the brain doing? We don't know. But it's more vague. For Brown, the epic is not perceived until it is completed. At that point, being a memory. So take epic four. I stir for 10 seconds. Again, it's an invariant structure, right? Structure is ongoing for 10 seconds. We have velocity, flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, acoustic invariance, texture gradients, ratios, flows. It's then going to be replaced by another such structure, like putting down the spoon. Are you going to hold that this structure, until this structure, that 10 seconds of stirring is complete, ended, the stirring is not perceived, not for 10 seconds, nothing going on in experience for 10 seconds till that stirring is complete, because the invariant structure hasn't changed, it's just ongoing. If you were looking for a criterion to define epics, isn't such an invariant structure the very thing that would be a candidate for defining an epic? But what principle then would you allow or would allow you to start seeing the stirring event sooner? How would I parse, say, that stirring into 10 segments, each one second long? By what principle? Or if I'm just flowing down the road, when, by what method do I start parsing that into epics, into segments, so I can see it? I don't think this registered with Dr. Brown. I don't think he saw it as a problem. So our invariant structured epics are simply going to flow into one another. There's got to be no discreteness, no atoms, discrete atoms of experience here. When I break up the eggs, then break the eggs and reach down and pick up the spoon and then insert the spoon to the batter, it's going to be real hard to find the break point for any of those. The fact is, though, this is the realm of the hard problem. And Dr. Brown has no answer to this question, the origin of the image of the external world. Again, the question that cuts through all theories of the hard problem. He's relying on memory, yet leaving storage vague. So he ignores Bergson's critical question, worry consciousness, and thus the hard problem. Is experience stored in the brain? This is the, is the question. Because note, all that, that being a conscious, dynamically changing perception, in theory, needs to be stored in the brain, according to the uh, current notion of memory and what the brain does, to account for the perception. You cannot divorce the problem of memory storage from the problem of conscious perception of events, namely our experience. So we need all this storage, yes or no? But in this, Whitehead is no better. For all his epics, there is no model of the origin of the image of the external world, which is to say, where is his account for the perceptual content of the epics? See, it, just like Dr. Brown is simply merrily talking about the epics and how they're strung together and when they're perceived, etc. But, but how are you accounting for the conscious content? This, the flow field and the stirring and the, and, and the forces and all that is seen, where is that coming from? That might be critical. So what would such a perceptual content theory look like? Well, this is what one looks like. And I apologize to the guys who've watched most, most of the series, but just for any Whitehead folks coming along, we go through it quickly. So we see the contrast.
we see what if a theory of perceptual content, which is to say the origin of the image of the external world would, world would look like. For in Berg's model, the field that we're in is a holographic field. And the brain is a modulated reconstructive wave. And what's meant by that in holographic process, a reconstructive wave, in that case right there, frequency one, that is a specific frequency is sent through the holographic plate where there's an interference pattern where an object wave from a cube with the original reference wave has been stored. And we then specify the virtual image of the cube. If I modulate that to frequency two, drive the wave through that, I, I specify a virtual image of a cup from another object wave. If I modulate the frequency three, I specify the uh, image or the wave front from the interference of an object wave of the reference wave of frequency three, namely a wine glass. Modulate back to frequency one, go back to the cube. So the brain in this case is the modulated reconstructive wave passing through the very large 3D hologram plate that we are embedded in. And it's specific to a source within the field. In this case, our bowl, our stirring, etc., our spoon. And it's right where it says it is, external, within the field. It's not within the brain or in some strange mental space. And it's specifying a past extent via the indivisibly transforming field. That is, is the past extent of the field. There, there are no instants. This is why the indivisibility of motion is so important. And it's at a scale of time via the brain's dynamics, the dynamics underlying this wave. In normal scale, a buzzing fly. Could have been a heron-like fly, barely flapping his wings. This is indeed a concrete wave, a concrete dynamics. It's not abstract symbol manipulation. It's what's required for a theory of consciousness, not the uh, abstract symbol manipulation. It's the current reigning favorite. So all of this, this little theory, is the origin of the perceptual content, ta-da, of an epic. Where is that? In Mr. Whitehead or Dr. Whitehead. Well, kind of went there. So we'll switch to relativity now. Whitehead's rejection of Bergson, that is the indivisible transformation globally of the holographic field, is at the core of his ills with relativity. His analysis and resolution of the twin paradox was in 1923, was uh, written up in an Aristotelian Society Supplementary, entitled The Problem of Simultaneity. Is there a paradox in the principle of relativity in regard to the relation of time measured to time lived? It was a symposium with H. Wolden Carr, our favorite, a mathematician, R.A. Sampson, and Whitehead. And it's discussed in a paper by Ellie During, a, a French Bergson guy who had the, I had the privilege of meeting in, in Japan. He's a brilliant French guy, French Bergson guy. And as he noticed, the phrasing of the conference program bespeaks of the Bergsonian context in the background. His special relativity critique, Duration and Simultaneity, had recently been published. His attempt to analyze the twin paradox and, and uh, straighten things out. Duran instantly, interestingly, follows the standard consensus. He says, Bergson was very much aware of the logical structure of the paradox, and he consistently emphasized the reciprocal character of the temporal distortion. Remember, reciprocal character here, We're referring to the fact that in relativity, you can't tell who's moving and who's at rest. The rocket can be taken as moving uh, and the Earth stationary. And in that case, it's the twin of the rocket that ages less, is younger. But the Earth could be taken as moving away and back. And now we switch. It's the Earth twin that's younger and the... Uh, guy in the rockets aging longer, aging worse. It's, re it's re reciprocal, and it's because of the fact that you cannot tell who's in motion. So Duran goes on. He, that is Bergson, is indeed famous, that is almost universally blamed for not accepting the theoretical consequences of Langevin's thought experiment. His strategy is clearly that of a debunker rather than a solver. Well, we'll come back to this. Whitehead, for during, is a solver. 
He says, granted, Bergson was mistaken in considering that there is no way within the conceptual structure of special relativity to differentiate between the twins. Here, however, it is clear that accelerations are involved. And we'll come back to this too. It is these accelerations that Whitehead will seize on. So, says Ellie, Whitehead relies on a very general argument involving the dislocation of simultaneity at the turnaround point, that is at the star in the traveling, traveling twins or rocket twins journal, in, journey and a subsequent blind spot in the reckoning of distant time intervals. So this is Whitehead's diagram and he's resuming the travel time for the rocket is 100 years Earth time to the star, 100 years back at 36, 365 revolutions um, per year, that's times 100, 36,500 revolutions, each way 73,000 total. To go on, when the traveler reckons time by days, what does he count? He presumably uses his own definition of simultaneity. So stopping there, those dotted lines are simultaneity lines, lines of simultaneity. For example, the red line is a set of simultaneous events at the star, when the rocket's at the star and the Earth has arrived 100 years later. But this line, as the rocket moves, we're seeing that events for the Earth that were some are far in the future and some are far in the past relative to what he thinks is simultaneous. And for the rocket, then, he, he's occurring or arriving at us far earlier than what the Earth thinks. So the rocket, he will count. 3.65 revolutions on his way out and 3.65 revolutions on his way back by some figure of speed that White is using. And he will adopt another definition of simultaneity and will count another 3.65 revolutions on his way back. So two 3.65 sets of revolutions. So we ask, what happened to the remaining 72,992.7 revolutions? He's got 7.3 revolutions total, and he's got subtracted from 73,000, that's what he's got left. What happened to those? Well, he says, he dropped those out of account in his sudden change of space-time systems at the star when he ceased his outward journey and commenced his return. Okay. And why is this? In the flurry of an instantaneous change of motion at S, the traveler dropped out of account the 72,992.7 revolutions between H1 and H2. So those are just gone, exploded between that, those lines of simultaneity H1 and H2, disappeared, they're gone. If he had noticed them, he would have counted them and would have agreed with the Earth chronologer on his return. So when the Earth or the rocket comes back and uh, lands on the Earth and the rocket twin emerges on a very young yet, well, we've solved the twin paradox. We have differential aging and solution. Well, some people don't think it's a solution, like me. So what does the trick here, Pirelli? The relativity of simultaneity combined with instant change of reference frames. Now, of course, you can always ask right off the bat, well, what if you just made a real gentle curve around? But we won't even go there. To me, this is just too easy. This is a nice mathematical, maybe just diagrammatic magic. There's nothing physical, nothing ontological about it. There's a ton of things wrong with it, but we'll just focus on this. It all depends on the reality of the relativity of simultaneity. Where'd that come from? Remember Einstein's one initial one example, the lightning bolts. We have our stationary observer. He's just standing there and two lightning bolts strike. The light bounces off the mirrors, hits the clock, stops the clock at two o'clock simultaneously. And he says, yep, they're simultaneous. But an observer moving by says, no, in, in reality, the clocks are not in sync because to the observer moving by, the velocity with the yellow arrow there, he's going to hit the uh, blue lightning bolt 
a little bit earlier. It's going to hit the clock a little bit earlier, and the, and the yellow lightning bolt, the, the light hitting the clock is going to arrive a little bit later because he's moving away from the yellow lightning bolt. So they're not simultaneous. So we have two lightning bolts taken at an instant. The zebra two moving towards the blue bolt, saying they're not simultaneous. That is, then this relativity of simultaneity taken at an instant is seen to have some ontological status, some reality. That, that all events in the universe, therefore, are, cannot be taken as simultaneous. That is, just because we think they are, they're not necessarily. That is, that this characterizes the concrete transformation of the universe, the relativity of simultaneity. It has a status, a real physical status. And this is what it says about Einstein's or Whitehead's view and or grasp of Bergson. To remind where Bergson already started in matter and memory, there must be real motion. To quote, though we are free to attribute rest or motion to any material point taken by itself, again, relativity, it is nonetheless true that the aspect of the material universe changes, that the internal configuration of every real system varies, and that here we have no longer the choice between mobility and rest. Movement, whatever its inner nature, becomes an indisputable reality. We may not be able to say what parts of the whole are in motion, relativity, motion there is in the whole nonetheless. There must be real motion, as we've noted. Stars explode, roses bloom, trees grow. These are simultaneities. The parts of these motions cannot be relativized. The simultaneity is intrinsically part of the motion of the whole. It does not matter what is the state of motion of observers. These organic motions cannot be relativized. Our guy sees simultaneity. Two points of that growing uh, rows meet at those two arrow points simultaneously. A rocket observer going by says, no, guy, you're in motion. Thus, they're not simultaneous. Sorry, not. You can't relativize this organic motion, this real motion. It's a real system. This is the real system that varies, the rows, the tree, the growth of the, the guy himself. Continuing, of what object externally perceived can it be said that it moves, of what other that it remains motionless? To put such a question is to admit the discontinuity established by common sense between objects independent of each other, that is, independent objects, having each its individuality comparable to kinds of persons is a valid distinction. For on the contrary hypothesis, hypothesis, the question would no longer be how are produced and given parts of matter changes of position, but how is it affected in the whole a change of aspect? And he compared this motion to that of a kaleidoscope. Within the global motion of this whole, the motions of objects, independent objects, so-called, so are in reality become, or now become changes or transfers of state, like waves in an ocean. In such a global motion, there is clearly simultaneity. The opening rose is a simultaneous flow, as noted others, well, a family eating, talking at a table, or geese flying over along with the river flowing beneath, etc. Sailboats be before a massive pressure front, or a massive storm, which is in, rea in reality the source of Einstein's lightning. These lightning bolts are simply an instantaneous cross-section, instantaneous, a mathematical instant cross-section of this flow. It's artificial, it's a mathematical artifice, using instance then to relativize this global motion of this storm, but this flow cannot be relativized. Sorry, just like the rows, someone could say, no, the bolts are simultaneous, just like the two points of the rows. It's an organic flow, it cannot be relativized. So in duration and simultaneity, Bergson did use a different approach to express this. He said, extend these local simultaneous flows across the whole, that is the whole field, mentally knit them together. They can be reunited, to quote, in a single experience unfolding in a single duration. That is, then we get the transformation of the universe regaining its simultaneity. But matter and memory is already an even deeper argument. 
you can see how this vision undermines Whitehead. Why Bergson would argue that this global flow of time, the transformation of the universal field, must be an invariant to both twins. So debunker versus solvers, Bergson merely the debunker. Well, this was his solution to the problem of the twins. Ellie's theoretical consequences, so to speak, as he said, of Langevin's thought experiment, a train wreck a mangled, wrecked, logically inconsistent theory. That's what was left of SR after Langevin was done with it. Special relativity cannot be used to explain ontological real effects. A younger age twin, a longer lived muon, a clock slowed when being carried on, on a jet. You cannot do this. Use these effects as being explained by special relativity and yet not, not destroy special relativity as the explainer Michael said Morley, where the length change of the apparatus arm is considered purely a measurement effect, a non-ontological, non-real effect. Remember, this was rejected as, as a real effect when Lorentz proposed it. A measurement effect, what it means is we're using measurement that changes, like a ruler. One ruler shows nine inches for the apparatus arm, the other ruler shows six inches for the apparatus arm. In the special relativity world, these rulers are light rays and clocks. Clocks synchronous or not synchronous. That's all it is. It's a measurement effect. It's not an actual change of the apparatus arm, an actual contraction. But in special relativity, time and space changes compensate for each other. Time unit expansion for space unit contraction, intrinsically, they compensate. They must then be of the same order. That is, they both have to be measurement effects. Time and space changes both. They cannot be real effects, or you destroy the Michelson-Morley explanation. So the theoretical consequences are BS, plain, invalid uses of SR. Bergson insisted some other theory is needed for these effects. If you want to explain the longer living muon or the jet slowed clock, you have to have a different theory. Special relativity cannot be so used for these real effects. This other theory he saw as the physicist's problem, their realm, not his. I've sketched one what would this could look like, just as Lorentz actually did, explaining time retardation without special relativity. A real physical model with physical forces, just like Lorentz had electrodynamic forces, not a mathematical mirage. It can be done, sorry, it may bring back the ether. White had never explicitly addressed Bergson's vision. His argument against Against it was, well, simply a mute rejection. For Ellie, granted, Bergson was mistaken in considering that there is no way within the conceptual structure of relativity to differentiate between the twins. Here, however, it is clear that accelerations are involved. Well, this is uh, actually sadly mistaken, but we'll come back to that. Um, Bergson clearly understood you could, you could invoke accelerations. Of course, accelerations are not within the conceptual structure of relativity, but that's yet another whole question. But we'll come back to that in a second. To go on, the crucial point is that one of them must experience three events, departure, turnaround, and return, whereas the other experiences only two, departure and return. The twins do not share the same space-time history, or life history in Whitehead's terms, and thus cannot be regarded as interchangeable clones. This simple fact is what Bergson seems to have overlooked. No, but why? Why two events for the Earth twin and three events for the rocket twin? The Earth twin with the Earth could equally be conceived with departure, turnaround, and return. This is exactly what Einstein did, trying to re preserve reciprocity and yet keep differential aging in an argument in 1918. So the rocket is conceived as neutralizing the motion of the Earth. The Earth moves away and then back again, rocket mode motors neutralize this, but then Einstein's wiggle out was at the turnaround, the, the Earth's turnaround, such large gravitational effects would come into play that these would cause the Earth twin to age. 
I say how because what you really want now is not a theory of relativity, but a theory of how concrete gravitational forces somehow affect physiological organism structure processes such that there's increased aging. But nevertheless, why would you worry about that? But nevertheless, so what? Make it a very small planet equal to the rocket in mass, even on this argument. Now, there's no difference. There's still reciprocity. There's no end to this. This is why Bergson didn't bother going into the accelerations and, and these particular little um, games. He stayed within Longevin's framework. But the accelerations, presumably they play into this magic difference. I say presumably because there's so much emphasis on the flurry of instantaneous change that, yes, we know some of the changes created by accelerations, but just one wonders. In any case, just a note, Langevin formulated this theoretical consequences, quote unquote, solely within special relativity as formulated in the uniform form velocity framework, where it belongs. This is the framework of Berger's analysis. Accelerations were introduced as folks got increasingly uncomfortable justifying Langevin and special relativity's proper, that is, velocity framework. But at the uh, uniform velocity framework, this is where Bergson was working, because that's where Langevin started the whole thing. Even if granted the acceleration thing, it's a red herring from Einstein, and Bergson noted this in Duration of Simultaneity. He said, well, velocity is the first derivative of the rate of change of position. Acceleration is the second derivative, rate of change of the rate of change of position. When you contemplate this for a second, you wonder how can the second be so privileged, so special over the first? How does acceleration gain this incredible aura, this, this power, this force? One can certainly derive the Lorentz transformations he noted in the context of accelerations. If you cannot, all of calculus, the very basis of physics, is destroyed. All you have to do is search weighing clock paradox for this derivation. It exists. But then, to the travels of each twin, we now apply this generalized Lorentz equation, equation set. Accelerations now make no difference, no change to their reciprocity. You're simply applying the Lorentz transformations in the context of acceleration. So time is still an invariant flow to both twins. Accelerations are not. Now, obviously, this goes right to the core of the general theory and the special position accelerations had. But yes, Bergson critiqued the thought experiments at the very base of the general relativity theory, the rotating disk experiment, the elevator experiment. Both he uh, critiqued and rather sharply. Recall the title of that symposium. I draw your attention to the last line, time measured versus time lived, or the objective science of the physicist versus vague philosophical fluff. Something about time being lived by beings and experience. One can read this entire work and still think, this is basically all the argument was about. It was so vastly more, sort of the core of what is now a mangled science, so actually purely a scientific problem. Yet Whitehead, he it is was seen on the side of the good guys, those sternly objective physicists, the keepers of the theory of time. I guess I'm disappointed with H. Wilden Carr. He seems he didn't, it seems he didn't transmit much of Bergson to Alfred at all. Whitehead seems to have made great impressions on the academic community for his, quote, resolution of the twin paradox, and as usual at the expense of Bergson, you know, who flubbed it, you know. His epical time is pretty much a total rejection of Bergson's vision, without any explanation as to why, to include the acceptance of the validity of Zeno and, and the rejection of Bergson, Bergson's analysis of the root cause of the problem. It is a theory, in my opinion, with little use to psychology or to the hard problem, but it certainly has an aura. Auras, well, didn't Heidegger have one of those too? 
So next, maybe some fun with this one. Sabine segment, Sabine Hausenfeld, or you don't have free will, but don't worry. We'll see on that. So till then, signing off.